Hello there folks, welcome back to the Chaps Guide. My name is Ash and I am your host on this journey through men's style, self-development and personal grooming. And today I thought I'd make a bit of a spontaneous questions and answers video. No preparation, I've just downloaded a few of the questions which have come into the channel over the last week or so and I'm going to take the opportunity to answer these questions here off the cuff, no preparation really. Um, I mean, I saw them when I downloaded them, but there's been no research or anything. So my genuine thoughts and views and opinions. Let us begin. First question comes from Rich Engel, 8970. So yeah, there we go. And the first question is, what is your opinion on safari jackets? Safari jackets. Okay, my initial thought is going back to the James Bond movies of the 1980s featuring Roger Moore, who often wore a safari jacket in some of those films. And I think they were far more prevalent then. However, I do notice they are becoming more relevant again in the modern era. And there is good reason for that because the safari jacket is very practical. All right? It's a jacket which has got lots of pockets, tends to be light. It's an ideal outer garment for the summer period. And if I remember, dragging this from my memory, the safari jacket takes its history way back into the annals of time, into the late 1800s and the Boer War, where the forces of the British Empire were fighting the forces of the Boers in South Africa. And at that time the British military was still in the habit of wearing those bright red tunics which were sort of quite famous throughout the world uh, at that time and the enemy they were fighting against fought in what then has become known as guerrilla warfare tactics so uh, sort of you know short sharp attacks rather than set pieces on a battlefield and they wore khaki which was quite camouflaged for the environment they were in and the British military transitioned over then to khaki and a sort of safari militaristic jacket which became popular much more widely as a consequence of people or those soldiers wearing them. They became popular in the hunting world, people who would need the advantage of camouflage in their business. Now in the modern era I think they are, yeah, they're less prevalent than they were maybe in the 80s but I think they're very cool. I think they're very practical. All of those pockets allow you to carry things quite easily. That militaristic style has something of a carryover. You know, I think it is quite smart. It does allow you to uh, wear sort of no uh, shirt underneath, t-shirt if you wanted to, or you could even wear a collar and tie. I have seen that done by gentlemen myself and it works quite well. <coughs> Excuse me. Some of the better British brands I'm aware of now, like um, Private White VC, they uh, do produce an excellent safari jacket, which I'm aware of. And even the King's Tailor, uh, Anderson and Shepherd on uh, Savile Row. I do recall seeing a safari style jacket in their catalog as well as much more uh, you know, accessible brands like Barber. They've all got safari style jackets in their ranges these days. So whilst I don't own one myself, I see its practicality, I see its coolness, and I will never rule one out. If I was in a situation where I think one would work for me, I wouldn't hesitate. So don't think they're a done deal in the past. We can bring them back. Now a second question from uh, Rich Engel, and that is, uh, you are, you seem pretty slim and looking healthy. It's an inspiration for other chaps, especially, especially as many middle-aged men are overweight and obese given the standard Western diet. Could you do a video on how you achieve this by covering a typical meal plan for your day, the number of meals you eat, what you eat for breakfast, lunch, dinner, etc. Okay, that's quite a broad question, which I'm actually going to put into a full-size video. But what I will tell you is that uh, I don't feel particularly lean at the moment. I feel a little heavier than normal actually over the last year because I've had a couple of good holidays within the last few months. And uh, you know, don't run away with the fact that being fit and healthy doesn't require constant vigilance and maintenance because when you let yourself go a little, the weight creeps on. And when one reaches uh, the 50s, it, the metabolism definitely slows down and you have to stay on top of that healthy regime. And the diet in the Western world does not help us at all. When I could take, you know, a pound 
a single unit of money, a pound, and I could probably go to a supermarket and buy a thousand calories with a pound if I invested it poorly. And, you know, I only need probably less than 2,000 calories a day in my lifestyle. So it just goes to show the accessibility of uh, food. But suffice to say, and I, I'll do a much more in-depth video on this shortly, I promise that, I eat three meals a day. Uh, breakfast is an, an important meal in my diet. So I will uh, eat a breakfast typically of porridge, oatmeal with lots of fruit. Lunch for me is typically a, a lighter meal with often vegetables and some form of protein. And then my dinner in the evening around about 7 p.m. will be uh, my main meal of the day, which will include um, carbohydrates, protein, and probably lots of fresh fruit and vegetables as well. So that's kind of how my, I balance up my diet. However, that said, it depends on what phase of life I'm going through. So if I'm doing lots of intense exercise, if I'm going through a phase where I'm doing lots of running, which I tend to do about twice a year, um, I go through phases, um, I will eat a lot more because my, my lifestyle dictates I can take on more calories. A period right now, I'm going to the gym about twice or three times a week. Uh, I'm trying to get my 10,000 steps every day. I'm not burning a huge amount of calories. So I moderate my intake of food. Basically what I'm saying is I am alive to my lifestyle and the necessity of my diet within that lifestyle. I don't just eat the same every day, all the time. What I eat is dictated by my activity levels on a day-by-day -day basis. But I will promise to make um, a video on this in some depth on my ideology around what's kept me in fairly good shape as I approach my middle years. So, next question. And this one is from Nina, regular contributor to the channel and a patron also. And Nina says, Ash, I've started keeping an eye on eBay uh, uh, here and there for heritage brands. I have a question. I'm putting together a swanky summertime night outfit, blazer, linen shirt, Italian woolen pants, very dicky green leaf. Now, I'm not familiar with who that is, but uh, I'm sure he's a savvy dressing chap. My question is, can one wear a pair of suede monk strap shoes with no show socks, or should I stick to suede tassel loafers? Regardless of what shoe I'm trying to buy, I'm going for the exposed ankle look. Okay. I know this is fashionable these days, that men tend to wear uh, the exposed ankle look, okay? First thing I would say to anybody attempting to go on this journey of wearing the bare ankle is, how old are you? All right, because I think beyond the age of 40, it's no longer trendy and viable, all right? I don't love the look anyway, personally. For me, it appears as if somebody is unfinished in the way that they've dressed. And if you show no sock when you're wearing a dress shoe, I kind of get that sense it feels a bit incongruous. Now, if you're wearing a very casual shoe, like an espadrille or a loafer of some kind, I can get the no-show sock thing to a degree. Right, particularly if you're in casual attire throughout your clothing. So if you're wearing, I don't know, a pair of chinos and a t-shirt, maybe for a day at the beach or something like that. But if we swap over then into more formal attire, you're talking about a blazer, an Italian shirt, woolen pants, trousers. Um, for me, the no-show sock really doesn't feel like it belongs in that company, particularly a, a, a quite a formal item like a blazer, um, the no-show sock for me is a daytime item and it's a, a certainly subtropical climate item of clothing or lack of item of clothing and it is for somebody I would suggest below the age of 40. People over 40 may be addressing a little more in keeping with their age. I would say that a, a proportionately coloured sock for the item that you're wearing may be more in keeping. However, if you are going to go for the no-show no show sock look, bare ankle look, I would say the loafer is the natural companion to that look. And the classic shoes, even a, a double monk strap, is perhaps a leap too far. But just my opinion, as ever, uh, I'm not a fan of the no-show sock. I live in a temperate climate, so uh, it's not something which is readily in my wheelhouse. If I lived in the southern states of the US, um, you know, uh, Southern America, somewhere like that, 
uh, South America or Africa or you know continental equatorial uh, other parts of the world maybe but for me not right now so next question question from Dominic Buttery who says to me I'm going to a wedding in Surrey at a country house in uh, in the summer invite says lounge suits or morning dress please help me is hiring a frock coat mad is wearing a business suit bonkers is wearing a lounge suit the same as wearing sweatpants okay here we go this is the problem with the vernacular of sartorial style because things actually don't bear any representation of how they sound a lounge suit isn't a suit that you lounge around in at home like a sweatsuit it's actually another term for a business suit so it's typically a two or three piece suit I would suggest a two piece suit uh, for a situation like this which is what you would wear for a day in the city yeah so two piece suit however you choose to uh, adorn that maybe you may be talking notch lapels two buttons uh, standard lounge suit that's a lounge suit all right just to put that out there it's not a suit that you lounge around in morning dress is how do I describe morning dress it is the formal attire more worn by gentlemen who get married before four o'clock in the afternoon so if you get married before 4 p.m you typically can wear a morning suit if you choose to do so morning dress is also what's worn to formal events such as royal ascot things like that and you'll be familiar with it because it has the uh, sort of director's coat with the tail at the back well not the director's coat but the morning coat director's coat's a little bit different but the morning coat with the tail at the back single button uh, link fastening uh, and it is quite a formal state of attire here in the UK pretty much weddings and society events like Ascot and so on would be the only occasions you would wear it um, so you could hire that if you wanted to but unless your family I would suggest it's not necessary all right so if you're attending a friend's wedding a lounge suit will be absolutely fine and I would go for you know because it's a summer wedding so you can go for something which is quite stylish you can go for a lighter color suit if you own one if you have just got say a navy colored suit you can dress it up a little so wear quite a strong colored tie wear a nice pocket square wear the boutonniere it's a wedding of course it's the time you get the chance to dress up your suit so go for it a little so i don't feel compelled to hire morning dress unless you're a member of the family and it's been suggested they would like you to do that uh, dress it up definitely wear a tie definitely wear a pocket square boutonniere something like that make it a little bit more flamboyant than you would wear to a meeting at the office but don't be put off by these fancy terms like lounge suit it is in effect a business suit just another way of saying it um, and uh, yeah morning dress you don't have to wear it just in the morning it's any wedding before 4 p.m you can wear a morning suit but don't feel you have to unless you've been told to okay next question from steve lee and steve says here's a question lanyards I work in an environment where I have to wear a lanyard for work with ID card dangling from it. It's an increasingly common thing. Does anyone else out there have a problem with them spoiling their appearance and these odd colours? What's your view on the bright and distasteful ones which people wear? Just a thought. Okay, well, Steve, absolutely. I spent most of my adult life in jobs where one had to display some form of visual ID. And, uh, you know, the lanyard these days is the eyesore of business attire because you know you work in a big office you need the lanyard to gain access to the you know the um, the key touch doors and things like that to get in and out you may need to present your credentials if you're entering a big office building to security staff so you need to display your lanyards and yet the actual lanyards themselves people use these as an expression of personality you often see people using pride colors on their lanyards or colors which are particularly relevant to them uh, or the, the company may issue a lanyard which has the company branding on it but unfortunately for you that branding is garish flamboyant and it doesn't go with your personal style you've kind of got to negotiate that uh, yourself 
One of the ways you can get around it, and one thing that I used to do, is instead of wearing it around the neck on a lanyard, you can put your identity badge on one of these little um, retractable uh, belt buckle, belt sort of clip-on things, little circular things, click on your belt, and then you can just whip it up and use it to access doors or show your identity when you want. So the lanyard, in effect, is reduced into a small retractable, uh, spring retractable device that you can clip onto your belt. It is visible hanging from the belt if it's necessary to keep it visible, but then you can just draw it up, use it when you need it, and it's not dominating your appearance, hanging around your neck, spoiling the look of your suit, your tie, or whatever. That's what I used to do. Uh, but probably a better way. If you don't want to wear it down there, get a little clip for it and just clip it onto your, you know, your shirt pocket or something like that. So rather than having that lanyard, you've just got it clipped on without the garish colours of the lanyard. So you're making the best of a bad job. But that's what I would do. For me, it's the little retractable thing on the belt. Best way to do it. Okay, next question from Jesse Betchold. Okay, do you have any recommendations for a starter affordable watch which is similar to the Rolex Explorer? Oh, well, the field watch category of wristwatches is one which is really quite brimming with quality items. Um, obviously, the one which springs to mind initially is the Tudor Ranger, came out in 2022. It's a little bit, well, I say a little bit larger than the uh, standard. Explorer, which is 36 millimeters these days, but of course Rolex now do a 40 millimeter Explorer. So the Ranger are 39 millimeters, very similar aesthetic, you know, uh, numericals on the dial, uh, stainless steel bracelet with a oyster type bracelet um, with a T-fit clasp on it. So you get a lot of flexibility in the comfort fit. It's a very nice watch. And if I remember rightly, it's relatively modestly priced at around £2,600. So worth considering that, the Tudor Ranger. It's the natural relation of the Explorer, but for less than half the price. Staying in the route in the Tudor family, the Black Bay 36 in stainless steel with the black dial is a very similar looking watch to the Explorer. A bit more expensive than its brother, the Ranger, at 3,200 odd if I remember rightly, but it's a solid performing watch. Um, doesn't have a T-fit clasp, got a slightly different aesthetic, 36 millimeters, but rugged, tough. Same as the uh, Ranger, it's got 100 meters water resistance with a screw down crown. So you've got a very capable field watch, but it does have a bit of a more dressy look. So that one can definitely be employed in other situations. Um, there is an alternative though, and I'm not wearing it now. I was wearing it yesterday. Uh, I wear a, a, a micro brand called Nirvana Grenchen. Now I don't own it, but Nirvana Grenchen actually make a watch called the Super Antarctic. And this is definitely uh, got a lot of the DNA of the Rolex Explorer involved in that watch. It's a 38 millimeter watch, 12 millimeters thick. So it's, you know, quite a nice size, a little bit smaller than the Tudor Ranger, which I would prefer. I think 39 millimeters is quite large on a watch, which doesn't have uh, a sort of dive bezel on it. So it's, it's a lot of dial on the Ranger, but at 38 millimeters, the Nirvana Grenchen Super Antarctic offers quite an approachable uh, piece. It has a Soprod Swiss movement in it. So even though it's a micro band, you've got a very solid movement inside. Again, screwed on crown, 100 meters of water resistance. Got a number of different bracelet options. I like the uh, beads of rice steel bracelet, which it comes with. Um, and that is, if I remember rightly, priced at about 750 US dollars. You get quite a lot of watch for your money there with the Nirvana Grenchen. I've been wearing one of their uh, Depth Master watches for the last two and a half years. In fact, I had it on this morning. I'm, I'm wearing a um, Rolex, what am I wearing? I can't remember. It's a GMT Master 2 today. I was wearing my Death Master yesterday and I absolutely love it. Uh, and I'm sure that that one would be a quite a nice little piece for that price as well. A lot of watch for a very reasonable amount of money. So next question from Bobby SM3TZ. Okay, sir. Ash, thanks for your content. I've built myself up becoming a major in the British Army. I now work in the private sector and have the opportunity to access bespoke clothing. Well done you, sir. 
Do you think it is the clothing that matters or how you assemble it? Robert, okay, Robert, well, the clothing does matter. Of course, there is a lot to be said. Bespoke clothing is the epitome of our aspiration as a well-dressed man, okay? If we can access bespoke clothing, you're going to get clothing which fits you perfectly. Uh, and you can invest in a suit from a, you know, a, a remarkable brand like Dejan Skinner. Uh, nearly 6,000 pounds will buy you a bespoke suit, but that suit's gonna fit you unlike any other clothing you've ever owned because it has been made specifically for you using the template of your body to prepare that item. So you're gonna get a great outfit, but it's how you wear it and how you assemble it. Okay, so you can be, you can have the smartest clothes in the world, but if you don't know how to wear them with confidence and panache, it's still gonna look like a, an, an uncomfortable man wearing a suit. So one of the things I say to people when they initially start wearing good quality clothing or formal clothing at all is, really commit to that undertaking. Don't be a guy who shies away in your clothing because you're a little embarrassed to be so smart amongst others who are perhaps less well-dressed. You know, people tend to drop the shoulders a little, the head goes down, they sort of close up a little in their, in their, in their, their stature. Be proud, wear your clothing loud and proud. Throw the shoulders back, display that beautiful clothing that you've spent money on and absolutely own it. Own the look, wear it well. The way that you curate the clothing has a lot to do with it, of course. You know, if you're buying, a, shall we say, a, a navy suit, make sure you have the accessories to go with it. For me, a fantastic navy suit, the complementary items is gonna be a white shirt, a light blue shirt, a pink shirt, maybe an ivory colored shirt. These go wonderfully with that type of suit. Then you wanna build a little tie collection. So a couple of ties which you know will be a beautiful color match with that navy. Burgundies tend to go rather well. Striped ties with, uh, you know, maybe a yellow color, something like that. Have a look at the color wheel. See what colors work well with navy. And don't forget which also work well with the shirt that you're wearing and wear it with a style panache and own the look. Do not be afraid to wear it loud and proud because if you've worked hard all your life, you've risen to the point where you're wearing bespoke, wear it, own that look and strut the street like a man who knows he's wearing or looks like a million dollars. Okay, next question from Ruda Barathan. Okay, that's a good one. What is the most expensive shoe you have ever purchased, used or new? Well, up to this point, the most expensive pair of shoes I've ever bought was a pair of Loke Burford boots, 1880, um, from the 1880 collection of Loke, and they cost me 250 British pounds at the time. Now, a long time ago, I committed never to spend big money on shoes because as you know, I teach this sort of philosophy, never pay full price for shoes or boots. There's always another way, right? You go on eBay, you go on consignment sites, you go on Vinted or all of these other auction sites or uh, reselling sites where you can actually pick up fabulous shoes, either secondhand or factory seconds or almost new for amazing prices, you know, less than half price. If you're talking about eBay, you can access world-class shoes for pocket change. If you're lucky, it's an auction, you've got to get lucky. You've got to know what you're bidding for. But every so often, you might really want something. And in the case of these Luke Burford boots, which I wear five years, I've owned them now, and I wear them every winter. They're one of my favorite boots. I lusted after these Luke Burfords. I bought a pair of these Luke Burford boots in a brown color, and I absolutely adored them, right? They worked well for me. The pair I owned was actually leather soles and, like, and a brown color. But I wanted a pair of the burnished burgundy boots with a day-night sole. I thought that's gonna be perfect for my winter months here in the UK. The leather sole is great, but leather doesn't work so well in cold, wet, slippery environments. I wanted the day-night sole. I could not find them anywhere. I looked everywhere. I looked for discount codes tried everything. I then eventually relented and bought them from the Loke website and I paid full price 250 pounds. 
That's the only time in the last 12 years I've actually paid full price for a pair of shoes or boots. I can tell you that now, hand on heart, because it is my mission in life to wear the best boots that I can, or shoes, and not pay full price for them. Okay, I think that is us. We've come to the end of our questions for the day. I hope uh, some of those questions threw some of my insights, observations and thoughts into the mix and it may help you on decisions or clothing journeys that you're making yourself. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up. Click subscribe if you'd like to see more like this. You can support the channel by buying me coffee or becoming a patron. My patrons get extra videos and we've got a bit of an extra dialogue going over on the patrons page uh, and you see their names at the end of the video too and you get all of the information about that in the show notes below. If you want to ask me a question, you know, sort of tap into my mind, see my thoughts and views, stick it in the comment section below. Or you can even send me an email and you will find my email address on the screen right now. So until the next time, wear your watches, your shoes, your boots, your socks, your suits with style, flair, passion and panache. And you will be the intentionally well-dressed man that I know you are. Until then, take care, and I will see you again very soon.